According to data from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, food prices have never been higher on a real inflation-adjusted basis. Since 1961, uh, real food prices have been steadily declining, but ever since the outbreak of COVID, food prices have dramatically shot up. And the question now is whether or not food prices will rise to a point where it becomes unaffordable for the average person to afford the same amount of groceries as they used to. Well, our next guest is here to address this concern and perhaps some of the myths around the agriculture industry right now. What really is the cause behind your really expensive grocery bill? We're going to be talking about this with Joel Salatin. He is a well-known author, speaker, and the co-owner of Polyface Farm in Virginia. He has published several books, including his most recent work, Polyface Micro, Success with Livestock on Homestead Scale, and he's appeared on numerous documentaries and podcasts, including The Joe Rogan Show. Joel, it's an honor to have you on Kitco. Welcome. Thank you, David. It's an honor and a, and a delight to be with you. Thank you. It's an honor to host you. Honors all mine, Joel. Let's talk about uh, food prices and the trend that we've seen in agricultural commodities, uh, not just, not just post-Ukraine, but before that as well. Now, the FAO food price index from the UN has been dropping uh, for the third consecutive month in June, but we're going to talk about that that later. I want to talk about first and foremost the uh, the, the medium term trend over the last couple of years. So as I've as I've mentioned in my introduction, uh, in real terms, the food price index, which is a basket of agricultural commodities, is now at the highest level since 1961 in real terms, and it's been steadily trending up, uh, dramatically trending up since the start of 2020. Before then, it's gone down, actually, in real terms since the start of the 2010. So what happened, uh, what happened in the last decade and then what happened in the last two years that really brought up food prices to extraordinary sure. levels, Joe? Yeah, well, what, what's happened in the last uh, a couple of, uh, of years is that COVID, COVID brought to the fore the, the fragility that the food system has been creating. So, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, the whole, um, the whole goal has been efficiency, 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 and centralization. Part, part of the efficiency equation has been centralization. We don't want, we don't want small producers. We don't want small processors. We don't want um, small canneries, small distributors. What we want is centralization. Mm. And that creates, a, um, you know, you, you, you know, all the phrases that you know, economies of scale, right, efficiency and all that. Well, what's happened with with COVID and and now uh, partly with the war in Ukraine as well. But what's happened with this with this uh, new uh, these new disruptions in the system is that the centralized high, uh, large scale efficiency has now shown up in its it, uh, cracks cracks in the system to where, mm. for example, um, uh, let me, let me just give you, give you, uh, an example. What if when COVID hit in early 2020, what if instead of the United States being supplied by, you know, a couple of hundred 5,000 employee centralized mega processing facilities, if instead the U S had been supplied by, um, you know, by, by 200,000, uh, 50 employee community-based, you know, slaughterhouses, canneries, distribution centers. Um, we we would not have seen the kind of shocks that we saw and are continuing to see. Right now, these large centralized facilities are reeling under quarantine procedures, uh, uh, HR procedures. You know, the CEOs wake up every morning, wonder, oh no, I wonder who's going to turn us in to the government today for not you know, uh, providing a, a, a week off because they were near, you know, somebody in sector A, there's just, there's, it's gumming up the works. It's, it's a, it's a new fragility. Whereas, you know, on our farm where we have 25 people and we process our chickens and we do things and we, we own a, a little processing plant with 20, 25 uh, employees. We're not 5,000 packed in a building. We're not running 24 seven. We, you know, we we do a a variety of different tasks and different things, and so um, uh, I don't wake up in the morning wondering, 
um, oh no, have we violated some you know new government rule or COVID procedure yeah. or or yeah. something like that? And so so for the first time in my life, suddenly the 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 increase in percentages, you know, Tyson Tyson increased um, beef prices 32 percent in the last twelve months. Um, for us on our farm, you know, ten percent has been plenty, and 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 so so suddenly this supposed efficiency which has been the you know the uh, the goal is now giving way to a new fragility and resiliency the word resiliency is replacing efficiency people are beginning to realize you know if we if we don't have resilience first there's nothing to be efficient about so first you have to have resilience Okay, let's go back in time a little bit, and I want to talk, go back to this uh, resilience and fragility, and maybe you not know, discuss whether or not these uh, these uh, these systems that were broken can be repaired, so to speak, Joel. Now, going back in time, all the way to the 1970s, I'm looking at this chart again, and in real terms, the food price index has peaked in the uh, mid 70s and has steadily come down throughout, all the way down to uh, to its its trough around the uh, mid-2000s, Joel, and then it steadily yes. ticked back up. Over the last 50 years or so, uh, not only has food become more affordable in real terms, but also the percentage of household disposable income spent on food in total has also come down dramatically since the Second World War. So let's put these two pieces together. Let's talk about the food price first. What do you think, you talked a little bit about this, uh, wholesale prices, uh, sorry, wholesalers, uh, machinery, technological improvements. Uh, what else contributed to this decline in food prices over the last 50 years? Well, there were several things that contributed to it. You know, one, one was the rise of, the fa- of what we know as the factory farm. And you know, the, the large scale factory farm, which was enabled by uh, cheap fuel, you know, before before fuel was cheap, you couldn't you couldn't amass that much stuff in one spot because you can't haul enough stuff, enough food in, feed in, and enough poop out, right? Yeah. So so you know, poop goes out, feed goes in. So um, so it was cheap energy, and then of course the antibiotic, the revolution in antibiotics, and uh, so so th- those things started happening. Th- th- those things enabled the 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 unprecedented consolidation centralization and and uh, and scale of these uh, of these very uh, large places now um, you know the, the thing about nature and biology is that it doesn't always respond to things quickly you know uh, the biological time clock runs on its own schedule it doesn't run on a mechanic schedule and so it took it took from that early amalgamation and centralization uh, capacity. It took a, a couple of decades, actually, for the fragility to start showing up, and so we started seeing it with, you know, uh, new um, uh, Campylobacter, Listeria, E. coli, right? Uh, food, you know, food allergies. You know, when 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 I when I was a kid, there there was no term of you know called food allergy. Nobody knew about Campylobacter, Listeria, you know, and, and all of these all of these. Um, all of these things are pushbacks, you know, MRSA in hospitals, C. diff, these are superbugs. Superbugs is a new phenomenon in the last, you know, 30 years caused by this unprecedented consolidation, um, um, antibiotic and hormone use within the factory farming system. So those are called externalized costs. People that, people like me, we, we viewed those those uh, ticking time bombs, if you will, as being externalized costs that were not captured at the cash register. So the cash register price was a fraudulent price when when everything you know uh, uh, came into the situation. You mentioned you, you mentioned uh, household expendable income on food. Yeah. Well, interestingly, yeah. interestingly, from the early seventies when it was seventeen percent. It dropped. It dropped down to nine percent pre-COVID. Interestingly, in that exact same period of time, health costs went from roughly seven uh, went from roughly nine percent uh, and, and and increased up to about seventeen or eighteen. So so the, the 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 health costs and the food costs have inverted in per capita thing. No. Now, um, yeah. many, many many of us think that there's probably a relationship right. between cheap food and health costs. Uh, versus 
authentic, high quality food. That's an interesting and, point. And, and being able to not be uh, sick. That's a very interesting point. So you're, you're saying perhaps the quality of our food has declined yes. over the last couple of decades. It, it, um, it, it, it is very, it, yeah, it, it is very, very much declined. The, the nutritional, uh, you know, um, now, I mean, today, for example, David, today, um, uh, broccoli, for example, has something like um, you, you have, you would have to eat seven pounds of broccoli today to get the same nutrition <laughs> as one pound of broccoli in like 1930. Uh, you know, these are very real. These the, the, the soil has eroded. The chemical fertilizers yeah. have reduced the nutritional capacity. So, you know, here, here's where we are. So we have we have cheap food and piles, piles of bushels, but we're we're still hungry. You know, it's interesting. So let, let's just go back to this. The share of disposable income spent on food in total, especially food at home. Exactly like you said, it has been steadily steadily declining since the 70s. Well, actually, since World War II, but I, this chart goes back to the 60s. Yes. Now, uh, now there's a couple of ways to interpret this, Joel. One, like you said, uh, perhaps it's because the quality of the food has deteriorated over the last couple of decades. Uh, food has become cheaper as a result, and so it's more affordable. You spend less of your total earnings on food. Uh, another way to see it, maybe people just eat less. Maybe people are slimmer now than they were in the 60s. I don't know. Uh, no, that's not that, that's absolutely not true. Empir okay. Empirically, o o obesity, obesity is way high, which, which is indicative of cheap food. Look, look, sugar is cheap. Protein is expensive. So so the obesity epidemic follows the cheap food policy because uh, um, candy bars are cheaper than pork chops. And so so when, when people want more, you know, more parties and and other you know to be able to purchase other things clothes yeah. and and vacations and whatever they they tend to um you know, they, they tend to shortchange their food in order to have more experiences and and um you know uh, assets you know what's interesting is that uh, the the the, the total both in terms of your disposable spending and in real terms the food prices have not have not changed uh, throughout the past recessions, meaning that it's the food prices have steadily declined up until COVID. And in uh, this chart, for example, that we were just talking about, the share of total percentage of uh, the, the share of your spending spend on food, that's been steadily declining as well. It, it seems to me that past recessions and economic contractions have not affected the price of food. Would you assume food prices to change dramatically during a recession? Uh, maybe there are certain foods that people buy more of during a recession and less of during a recession. Well, you know, what happens with, a, I mean, the Wall Street Journal just carried a fascinating story about how people are now buying whole chickens instead of parts and pieces. The, the cost, the, the cost doubles when you buy, when you buy boneless, skinless breast and parts and pieces, you're paying double what you could, what, what you'd pay if you bought the whole chicken and cut it up in your own kitchen. And so suddenly, uh, butchery classes are hot. I mean, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, sour sourdough starter, baking your own bread. I mean, during right. uh, during 2020, in 2020, the number one Google thing in like October of 2020 was uh, how to make sourdough starter. Um, people weren't buying bread; they were baking bread. And so, what, what what all that does is it tends to it tends to shave some of the the dispose the food costs because unprocessed food is way, way cheaper than processed food across the board. Yeah. There was a, it's interesting. There was a, there was a major dip in, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the share of disposable income spent on food during COVID. Um, I, I, that's interesting yeah. to me. You would, you, you would yes, think you well, still need to eat, but. Yeah. Well, 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 listen to this, David, in 2020, in 2020, one in the U S 1 million, 1 million backyard flocks of chickens were started. Now, if you if if you figure that that mm. that every every one of the, that those flocks averaged, let's just say they averaged five chickens. Okay, five chickens. That's five million chickens. If you if you look at the egg production from that, that that is a a massive amount of egg production. Um, Lehman's Lehman's, which uh, is a major uh, seller of canning canning jar lids. Right. They sold in 2020, they sold 10 years worth of lids in one year, which means backyard gardens were going in. Um, and, and so so when, when you have a do it yourself, when, when you have uh, economic uncertainty and people start, start to try to save money, they start trying to do some of this 
production and processing themselves and they're not buying as much from the store they're actually having gardens and chickens and and and, and buying you know unprocessed you know buying a uh, a quarter of a beef uh, and a and a, a whole chicken, you know those sorts of things. Uh, I, before I move on to the uh, to to more of my questions, I'm just curious, Joel, how much of your personal disposable income is spent on 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 groceries? Because you are a farmer yourself, I'm just curious what a farmer actually actually you know spends outside of his own farm. Percentage wise, do you spend anything? Oh yeah, we spend something. Uh, you know, if we could grow our own toilet paper and uh, and, uh, and and tissues, you know, we could pretty much pull the plug on society. But no, we you know we we buy flour. Um, okay. But you know we, yeah, it's 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 very very minimal. I mean, our our percentage is probably you know two uh, percent or something like that. It's it's pretty low. You, you, we, what's we, on your farm, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, sure. So we have we have uh, all the animals, cows chickens, pigs, eggs, uh, sheep, ducks. Yeah. Uh, and then we have apples and mulberries and pawpaws and all the produce and vegetables and grapes. Um, so, you know, it's a, it, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff. Uh, just turning back to the food price, the decline of the last couple of decades, how much of that decline, uh, that this multi-decade decline can be attributed to globalization, do you think? Yeah, well, I, I for sure, uh, David. I, I think that the uh, the decline in those food prices ref did did in fact reflect a uh, an efficiency of scale. Uh, there's there's no question about it. But it also reflected an an increasingly externalized cost that wasn't captured at the cash register. You know, costs like these 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 germinating problems that were percolating underneath, like you know, uh, E. coli and, and, and salmonella and avian influenza and things like that, high, you know, high pathogen avian influenza, things like that. And, and so, so those were all percolating under the surface. And so what happens is when you have a black swan, a black right. swan event like we've just had, right. it, 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 it doesn't actually create the crisis. It simply, uh, it simply uh, brings that crisis to the fore where suddenly everybody sees it you know every, every, now, now it's a now it's a real problem i'm just curious joe uh, i wonder if you know this how much of the average consumer the average american consumer's produce comes from uh outside the u.s in other words how much of our food comes from overseas joel yeah so right now that percentage is 20 percent. so oh, wow one in one in five mouthfuls of food that consumed in america one in five mouthfuls of food is produced outside of the u.s Okay, and, and that that that, by the way, is the highest it's ever been in history. And so, you think that with the outbreak of COVID, with uh, supply chains shutting down around the world, do you think that percentage can come down? Because now people are thinking to themselves, we can't depend on foreign suppliers for food. We've got to we've got to start, you know, ratcheting up our domestic production. Yes, absolutely, and that's what we're seeing all over. That there's a there's a renewed interest in in localization rather than globalization. And and that's driving everything from, you know, from production to processing to distribution. Uh, there is uh, I, I would call it the new, um, you know, the new objective, if you will, rather than globalization right. is actually at atomization, uh, atomization. In other words, breaking up and and having a smaller, you know, closer, know your farmer, know your food, you know, uh, uh, smaller outfits that are that are less um, less susceptible. Uh -huh. to the kind of, uh, uh, you know, shakeups okay. that, 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 that are, are not necessarily, they can be energy related, they can be health related, they can be regulatorily related, they can be relationally, uh, uh, you know, created, created just relationally. People are, people are angry. And so I don't like that person. So now HR, you know, so all these big companies, they, ha they have to hire twice as many HR people to deal with everybody who's angry about the, the situation. Whereas a very, very small company where people tend to be more friendly and you know each other, you're a big family. You, know, you don't have those kinds of, um, you know, um, uh, you don't have those kind of gumming up the works and it, it's a, it's yeah. a big, it's a big shift. So the average the average uh, uh, consumer in in the U.S. Joel, he's probably wondering, okay, well he knows that his grocery bill has gone up, and you've explained in great detail as to why. But he's probably also reading the news, and a lot of headlines are saying, well, the war in Ukraine has made prices go up even more, and he's probably scratching his head, thinking, well, Ukraine's all the way over there, 
I'm over here. What's the relationship? Can you explain? Well, sure, because the global system is is highly inter inter uh, interconnected. Uh, you know, Ukraine supplies what is it? You know, thirty percent of the world's uh, wheat, and now they can't export it. Russia supplies. Uh, what, uh, 20, 25% of the world's uh, chemical fertilizer. And uh, now people won't, won't, won't buy for them, from them or they won't sell it. And so, you know, um, th this is fundamentally changing the... Um, uh, but most know, of the, our... The, most the, of it's, our... Fundamentally changing the, it's fundamentally changing the protocols, mm. uh, the protocols from, from the farm to the plate, uh, you know, all the way through. It's, it's changing the protocols, just like, just like for example... Um, uh, you know, contactless retail uh, changed the right. you know the the, su the supermarket idea now uh, and 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 then you have these you have these um, these major uh, glitches within the system. I mean, you know, I, I, we're we're trying to reprint a couple of my books and you can't get paper. Why? Because all the fiber has gone into cardboard for Amazon Prime. Sure. Because what people sure. used to bring out of the store in a bag now comes to their front door in a box. And so it, it it completely changes the way the supply chains work. Oh yeah, so so you're, okay, so it's deeper than just the commodity price itself. It's the entire supply chain has has uh, has has made food prices higher because the the average person is probably thinking, okay, well, yes, wheat has gone up, barley has gone up, um, sunflower oil uh, has gone up, um, but those are. Not 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 too much of our wheat and barley and sunflower oil and canola oil. Not much of that comes from Ukraine, right? I mean, a lot of that can still be locally produced. So we should still be relatively insulated. Yeah, which is which is which is why uh, we're already starting to see some of these prices come down right. as right. as other as people adjust. Right now, you know, trust me, the U.S. farmers, U.S. farmers, South American farmers. In Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, uh, Argentina, they're they're adjusting to this already. Historically, commodity prices like grain, especially grains that are annuals, you know, corn, beans, wheat, barley. Uh, historically, those those price anomalies never last more than about six months. Mm. Due to North America, South America, South America, their their summer is our winter. Our summer is their winter. And so if we have a shortage in, in North America, South America plants more. If there's a if there's too much, then you know they plant uh, plant less. And so generally between North America, South America, we have a pretty rapid response. And so now with these high prices, um, farmers are already responding and and you know uh, these grains that are that are annuals that are on an annual cycle, um, it's it's Farmers can respond to that very, very rapidly. Okay, yeah, and uh, people are now concerned about a possible food shortage situation in the U.S. Is that is that something that's realistic, Joel? Have you ever seen that in your life? Experience that? I, I, I've certainly never seen food shortages uh, in my in my lifetime, and um, and that's a little bit beyond my expertise to know the the realism of that. I mean, I know that. Uh, just in the last month, some uh, tens of thousands, I don't know if it was 100,000, but it was it was a lot of, yeah. uh, of cattle died in heat in Oklahoma in feedlots. Again, you know, um, feedlots are very unhealthy. And so when you have, um, I, I'm not sure we want to go into the rabbit hole of, of climate change, but, right. but when, when, you, when you have heat stress, when you have any kind of stress, um, uh, you know, pathogen stress, toxicity stress, heat stress, climate stress, you have any kind of stress on an animal that's already on its on the edge of its uh, on the edge of its capabilities, because, you know, like it's an herbivore, herbivore eating grain, herbivores mm -hmm. aren't supposed to eat grain. And so it changes the the, um, you know, the rumen in the animal reduces their immune function, then they're more susceptible to die. And so, so this is the kind of thing that, that breaks down. So, you know, this, this, this food, um, you know, food shortage thing, it, I can assure you if, if there is a food shortage, it will not be because we don't have um, the capacity to raise it. Uh, it'll be because we are too, um, whatever, unadaptive or uncreative 
to punch through it. I mean, like our farm, we're watching all these things happen, the fertilizer prices, the wheat prices and all that stuff. And, 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 you know, we buy all our grain from uh, nearby farmers, GMO free. Um, and we know the farmers, we know where it comes from. And so we, we have this very uh, specific supply chain. And so the farther, the farther away your supply chain gets, right. The, the, the longer that chain, the more fragile it becomes. Um, I think when people talk about food shortages, they're having this um, mental flashback of what happened in uh, the outbreak of COVID when they went to stores and you couldn't buy toilet paper. The shelves are kind of depleted of uh, basic necessities. They weren't, there wasn't a food shortage back then, but that's what people are thinking about. If I go to Costco, there's no food left. Um, that's an extreme example. Actually, there are modern day contemporary examples of food shortages. If you look at Venezuela, for example, that's obviously a very peculiar case because they have price controls on food. Uh, they relied heavily on imports, but they didn't have any dollars to pay for these imports. And so uh, the agriculture sector in Venezuela was underdeveloped and they didn't have any food to provide for anybody. Of course, price controls didn't help. Um, would that kind of extreme example ever happen in the U.S.? Well, I mean, I mean, it, it certainly could, but uh, I mean, nobody in the world goes hungry because there's not enough food. I mean, for the first time in human history right now, we are we are uh, throwing away about 40 percent of the human edible food on the planet. That's never happened. That's been unprecedented in, in world history. Why are we throwing it away? Because it, it spoils because it's the wrong size. It doesn't fit the box. You know, there there, there are all sorts of reasons why that food is spoiling. I mean, I just talked with a, a, a fellow in, uh, in Zimbabwe that exports green beans to the Europe, to Europe, to the EU, and uh, they're processing two tons a day and they're throwing away two tons. I said, why are you throwing away two tons of green beans a day? Well, because they're too long or too short or too fat or too skinny or too crooked or, you know, whatever. And, and, and so, so right now, 40% of the world's food supply is being, is being disposed of. Uh, that's never happened in human history, and it's caused primarily due to um, these the uh, uh, long delays, long warehousing, and long supply chains. So mm -hmm. as soon as you as soon as you uh, uh, localize things and, and and regionalize them, then suddenly you don't have that much wastage, and you have you have uh, you know you don't have stuff sitting in you know warehouses forever, and and it. Uh, it completely changes things. And, and then when people get in their kitchens, they begin, right. you know, be, being able to use a little bit of blemish. You can cut out a little blemish, you know, that right. sort of thing. And you, you can, you can, util, you can uh, uh, utilize, you can salvage a lot of that imperfect stuff. Speaking of uh, localization, you know, a lot of people, well, you go to the grocery store, you, you very rarely think about the provenance of your food. But when, when you do stop and think about it, why am I getting my tomatoes all the way from California if I live on the East Coast, for example, or oranges? Or why am I, I mean, obviously there's certain products that can't be grown locally, but why am I getting my, why am I getting my corn from all the way from Nebraska when there's corn right outside, you know, a couple of miles away from where I live? Well, the answer is, is because it's cheaper, actually. Does that make sense to you, though? Well, it, it's it's only cheaper. Cheaper is an illusion. It's 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 an it's an illusion. Um, you know, inter, uh, Iowa. Let, let's take Iowa. Uh, perhaps the most fertile soil, the best growing area in the whole planet. Right now, in Iowa, only five percent of the food consumed in any city or county in Iowa is grown in that city or county. That's 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 crazy, okay? Um, and and the reason for that is because, for example, if if I have tomatoes and I call Kroger's down here and say, "Hey, I've got a bunch of extra tomatoes here uh, in Virginia. Can I come down and sell?" Well, no, they have non-compete clauses in their agreements with the large distributors, so they they can't they can't get from a local source if there's an overage because. Uh, you know, because they have a, a year-round uh, agreement to get them from some other uh, supplier. So what you have is 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 this this is not an this is not a, an ecological problem. Yeah, uh, it is yeah. not a resource problem. It is a uh, it it is a a a corporate and regulatory problem. Uh, within the food system that has been created because it has become so centralized. And 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 scaled up for quote unquote efficiency 
But then when you have these kinds of things, it shows up, well, maybe it's not that efficient. Maybe it would be actually be more efficient to uh, have a, a closer source. Joel, I'm going to get your outlook on the food industry and food prices at the end of the interview. Um, so we'll come back to that. If you're watching this right now, leave your thoughts in the comment section down below on whether or not you think food prices will continue to decline or whether or not you think food prices will stay elevated or perhaps go back up. Joel, I want to ask you this. If you were to solve world hunger, right? Right now, there est it's estimated that uh, 829 million people around the world are undernourished. About 10% of the people globally are affected by extreme hunger. If you were to eradicate world hunger, how would you do it? Well, what I would do is go to uh, libertarianism on across the board on the governments and get the government out of the food business, including, including shipping uh, shipping junk food to Africa. Uh, one of the most interesting experiences I ever had was a few years ago at the um, at, at a, a big uh, food conference in Italy. There were 140 co countries there. I was a speaker from the U.S., but I made a point to go to every African delegation there. The, the, it was the, the slow food, the slow food movement, the slow food convivium there in, in Italy. And uh, I went to every African delegation that I could go and listen to when I wasn't talking. And every single one of them said, we have all the resources we need. We can produce all of our own food. All we need is for the Western countries to get out, leave us alone and let us do our thing and we'll be just fine. And, and, and truly they do have a lot of socioeconomic problems. I worked with a group of uh, Lutheran women that did food relief in uh, Zimbabwe. And, uh, and th these women started raising uh, chickens and they had a market for it. They could do it. They had the infrastructure. They had everything was 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 great for it. But it whole the whole thing collapsed because they couldn't get ahead of the uh, gangs of roving males, young men uh, that roam the countryside and steal everything. And, and so so th these you know you got to realize that these this this hunger thing is is primarily not a it's not a resource problem. It's not a production problem. It is a socio-political. Uh, um, mm. it, 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 it's it's a it's a it's an orchestrated problem. Goodness, um, foundations for freedom in Africa, uh, Alan Savory's group, the Savory Institute. There, there are there are great groups working in Africa showing how they can easily you know uh, triple and quadruple production, even even on very miniature farms of, of two and three and four acres, very, very small place. Right. But, uh, uh, you know, fa families, you know, they, they, the, the, the guys go off and they get slaughtered and then, you know, the women, the women don't have any standing. And so, um, you know, w women can't hang on to their land and it, it's just a, it's just a, a real issue. But I, I certainly know many people in Africa, we've actually had, uh, we actually had a, a, a king in one of the countries come and visit us. And all of these people, they, we can feed ourselves. Just quit dumping stuff and displacing our entrepreneurs in our in our cultures, and we'll feed ourselves just fine. Thank you very much. There's a lot of, um, there's quite a few number of startups and, uh, and uh, enterprises working on this problem. Um, you know, one of the solutions people are looking at now is uh, eating, creating insects uh, for food. Not creating, but using insects for food, grinding them up, uh, putting them in powder and whatnot, and that should be provide uh, protein to uh, developing nations. Uh, Joel, there's another there's another school of thought. Well, not school of thought, but there's another, I guess, idea that's been floating around for decades. Actually, is that, like you said, there's a surplus of food here. Why can't we just take the surplus of our food and ship it over to the uh, malnourished areas? Wouldn't that just equalize the problem? No, because it displaces the entrepreneurial spirit in those countries. And mm. most of it gets siphoned off in the black market. It gets siphoned off by, you know, by displaced entrepreneurs, warlords and things like that. And, and so it doesn't actually get to the people. You, you can't help the power less by going through the power full. If your program thinks that you're going to get to the power less by, by giving, by giving uh, things to the power full, um, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. Uh, you, you, you have to empower the power less, right. you have to empower the power less by, um, by allowing entrepreneurship and, and, and real, uh, development inside. The problem is when that shipment comes in, 
It's going to be controlled by powerful interests, and it's and, and whatever nascent entrepreneurial agricultural endeavors are being done in the in the country, uh, those then become displaced with you know cheap foreign aid. Okay, that's a very good explanation. Interesting. Uh, do you think that there's going to be a huge wave of technological advancements or innovations that could perhaps spark another industrial revolution, especially in the agriculture uh, space? Re recall that in the early uh, 1900s, uh, the first industrial uh, revolution completely changed not just agriculture, but society at large, because with the advent of tractors and uh, other machine farm machinery, we had uh, a huge increase in the output per farm and actually output per farmer which over time means that more farmers could, you know, move to cities and pursue other professions. Basically, we needed fewer farmers to produce the same amount of work and other professions uh, thrived. Uh, is this something that could potentially happen in the future as well? Uh, what, 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 is the, what, is the, what is the path of technological development in the agriculture space is my question. Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question. And, and my position is that that food is primarily biological and not uh, mechanical. Hmm. And, and, and so the, the, the whole industrial paradigm is that food is primarily mechanical. So we can, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a bearing in a, in a front wheel in a car and you can m move around the DNA and you can, you know, you can put uh, chemicals in the soil and, and you, you, you know, uh, it's basically a mechanical process. I view food as fundamentally biological. Now there are mechanical aspects to biology, right. but, um, but, but biology is fundamentally different than mechanics in that it, it, is, it is complex. It's not, um, you know, it, it's not specialized. It's not simplified. It's, um, you know, it, it's eclectic. And so uh, the, the, new, the revolution that I would see uh, coming down as, as the industrial and mechanical paradigm uh, kind of you know, when Joel Arthur Barker wrote the book Paradigms and, and, and created the word for, you know, for, for normal business lexicon, one of his axioms in the book is that, um, that every paradigm eventually um, o overruns its own uh, usefulness. In other words, it, 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 it implodes uh, because of either scale or, or, or something uh, that, that happens with that paradigm. And I think we're beginning to see the, the end of the uh, of the fraudulent mechanical food system, the fraudulent mechanical soil system, and the new revolution will be biological. So we're going to see. Uh, so so what we're seeing now are are immunological absorption absorption uh, um, techniques, soil building techniques, um, uh, being able to speed up composting, uh, being able to use our machines to. Uh, to handle large amounts of carbon on farm cheaply. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the revolution that I see coming will be fundamentally biological, where we move away from the, from the cheating, from the, from, the, from the ecological cheating that we've done for several decades yeah. with a mechanical approach to life and instead moving to a biological approach to life and appreciating um, the, the leveraging of the, of, of the microbes and the immune function and the carbon cycle and the decomposition cycle in, in life. Well, I want to ask you for your opinion on this. Uh, there's been uh, research done that, uh, that suggests that food consumption is really, really bad for the environment. Um, not only does it uh, take up a lot of space and farms, but it also uh, adds to CO2 emissions for a variety of reasons. And so there's this movement to, uh, to, to, uh, to become less dependent on meat. And actually, you're seeing this in, in many developed nations around the world. Meat consumption per capita has been going down. Um, in the extreme example, uh, what do you think of the idea of completely eradicating uh, organic meat consumption and going towards a synthetic meat path? They're, they're already doing research on producing uh, synthetic meats. Uh, how do you feel about this? <laughs> well, you're talking to a livestock farmer, so you know. <laughs> yeah, let, let's just be honest with the transparency. But, but uh, no, uh, from a from a big picture standpoint, uh, this is again, this is just another permutation of the mechanical view to life, and so uh, so there there is no there is no functional animalless ecology 
on the planet. Uh, every place has animals. There are lots of reasons. We don't have time for me to go into it yeah. here. Uh, but but um, but animals play a huge role. In fact, right now, to my knowledge, there is no truly um, organic production system that does not supplement with animal manure. Even if even if it's a farm that doesn't have any animals, they import manure from from somewhere. Um, uh, and, and so so the animal component is real. Now nutritionally nutritionally, uh, we know that that pseudo meat, fake meat, lab meat. Uh, doesn't hold a candle to the real thing. Uh, uh, you know, we 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 know that. That's that's empirical. You can you can put it in a lab and and check it, and there's no comparison as to the nutritional quality. And so, um, uh, finally, I would say I would simply say if we are looking for a a uh, any a, a democratic or an egalitarian access to food, which I think you and I would agree, we would like to see. Uh, you know, universal egalitarian access to food. That's a that's a good objective. Um, there is nothing that that would uh, destroy that faster than having food come from a laboratory. The beauty of an animal is if I've got a chicken in the backyard, a, a, a cow, uh, you know, a milk cow in my uh, in my lawn. Um, you know, as long as the sun shines and the rain falls, uh, I can have food. But if my food comes from a ten million dollar uh, uh, laboratory owned by Bill Gates, that is not that is not an egalitarian uh, democratic food access conduit. And so, to me, one of the single biggest red flags. I mean, ecologically, nutritionally, but an, an additional red flag is if you really want to be empowered to 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 participate and to be able to access your own food. It's not going to become from a. It's not going to come from a laboratory. It's going to come from your own backyard, and so so the real the real plant, the real animal. These are the real antidotes to um, to food control from yeah. mega corporations or you know or, or tyrants. I'm going to finish off on food prices, and I'll let you go, Joel. This has been a fascinating discussion about agriculture. I learned a lot in the last 40 minutes. Um, I just want to close on this interesting statistic. You you obviously know about this already, but back in the uh, back in the Soviet days in the USSR, I believe the some, the stat was something like uh, ninety percent of the produce produced uh, in the USSR came from ten percent of the farms, and those ten percent. Uh, were a government experiment. They allowed that 10% of the farms to be private enterprises, and they outperformed in terms of production and quality every other single state farm uh, in the country, in the region. And so that, that highlighted, obviously, the, uh, the, the failure of the Soviet system to control food production. So let's talk about today. What do you think is the role of the government in the agricultural sector? Do you think we should have... Uh, on the one hand, on one extreme example, con complete control, which is what the USSR had. Uh, do we, do you, should we continue with a partly subsidized system, which is what we have today, or continue on the path towards completely, uh, complete laissez-faire, which is no government intervention whatsoever? Uh, that, that's a great continuum you've outlined there, David, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so it, it, in my view, uh, pretty much. Every every market intervention that the government institutes, whatever whatever market intervention it is, is always negative and and prejudices and skews the innovation and creativity within the marketplace. And so, uh, you know, if, if I were king for the day, I would uh, just abolish the USDA and uh, let and, and and let the whole system have at it. And and if people are afraid of unsafe food, well, there would be private there would be private outfits like you know AAA in automobiles or Underwriters Laboratory in electronic gadgets. Uh, you know, you 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 could join uh, different groups that had different values. You know, um, uh, to you know to to check up to to the tremendous amount of private certification. And and so you've really hit on one of my you know pet uh, issues. Is the Uberization of the food system? Um, that that's where we need to go. Historically, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker lived in a village where everybody knew who the good ones were and who the bad ones were. As we industrialized, the butcher, baker, and candlestick maker started uh, getting huge and behind no trespassing fences with security locks, and the opaqueness created 
a, a, a perceived need, a perceived need to have a bigger uh, regulator than the, than the industry was because nobody knew what was happening behind those fences. Well, with the internet now, with the democratization of information, Mm. And, and and being able to to personally vet and monitor, we have the uberization of 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 uh, possibility. And you know who would have guessed you know twenty years ago that people would jump into cars with people who don't have a special license, haven't been to limousine you know a chauffeur driving school, and whose vehicle doesn't have a special decal, who aren't members of anything except an electronic you know uh, uh, cyberspace kind of thing, and say take me to you know take me to this place and trust somebody to take you there. You know Airbnb, Airbnb. Who would have guessed? You know, uh, 40 years ago, that we would in in uh, in 15 years have as many new hospitality options as Marriott, Sheraton, and Hilton combined, without ever pounding a nail. So Airbnb and Uber are, are examples of where people self-regulate. It, it's through uh, democratized democratized vetting through real time uh, um, uh, through real time choice exercised through the internet, and it has brought back. The global, the global voice. It is. It has globalized the village voice of the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker mm. of 1500. Has now been. Has now created an option for us to bring the butcher, baker, candlestick maker back, even if they're shipping across the globe with five stars, four stars, three stars, and reviews and real time of vetting like Airbnb and Uberization. So it is time. It is time to leave. The, the industrial Neanderthal barbaric uh, government interventionist uh, 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 bureaucracy of food, right. Uberize it so that you and I and everybody else can exercise our food choice in voluntary consensual relationships with our producers and have voluntary democratic access to food. Well, I, I think proponents of uh, government subsidies of food would argue, Joel, that we've become too large a society. We've we, we're, 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 we've progressed beyond the villager, uh, you know, personal relationships between the butcher and the and the farmer uh, on a localized level, and that we actually need government protection because without subsidies, without controls, without price controls, food prices could, in theory, skyrocket to unaffordable levels. Should demand far outweighs supply, which could happen if we have immigration, uh, population boom yeah, and whatnot. Well, that's that, 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 that would simply, that argument would be, would, uh, would be identical to saying, well, we can't allow uh, Uber drivers because the price will escalate out of control. Mm. And, um, and what happened was Uber actually dropped prices. Uh, it, it, it competed with licensed chauffeur companies and taxi companies and created mm. competition. Competition always reduces prices. Mm. Tyranny, bureaucracy, in, arbitrarily increases prices. So if you want prices to plummet and if you want democratized access, what you want is additional entrepreneurship, additional competition, not less. All and right. that's, what, that's what reducing the interventionist policies would offer us. So putting all this together now, talk, putting, all, putting together geopolitics, technological re, uh, innovations, the revolution you're talking about, um, government policies, where do you think food prices will go from here in the short term and long term? Remember that chart we talked about in the beginning? Let's fill in the blanks here for us now, Joe. <laughs> Well, the, the one thing I don't do, David, is prophesy. I've got a whole file. <laughs> I've got a whole file of, uh, of of crazy things people have said over over time, oh. and, and so um, boy, you know, I can't see the crystal ball. I don't know where it's going. I I, I do believe. I do believe that um, that the 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 uh, the atomization um, is occurring as as people uh, start to mistrust. Ma when people begin to mistrust major institutions, they begin making market changes, whether it's putting in a garden, going out to visit a farmer, uh, purchasing directly from a, you know, from a farmer. And farmers make different, farmers say, ooh, I, you know, I'm not gonna get my wheat from Ukraine. I'm gonna see if I can work out an arrangement with some farmers in Kansas to grow my wheat. Uh, those, those kinds of things that what I call the atomization uh, is already happening. And I think that we're going to see that as our major institutions from government to corporate to whatever, as those major institutions lose trustworthiness in the marketplace, we're going to see innovative relationships develop 
that are more regionalized, that are more transparent, and that are more based on trust than what we've seen in the past. And I think all of that is very positive. So finally, uh, in closing off, you don't think there's going to be a food crisis in the U.S. in the foreseeable future, or will there be? Well, if there, I'll just say this. If there is, it won't be because it's not raining and the sun's not shining and there's no soil and no farmers. Mm. It will be a manu, whatever crisis there is will be a geopolitical manufactured crisis. Mm. It will not be because we don't have abundance in our in our ecological womb. Well, I don't know anybody in my own personal and professional circle who's stockpiling on canned food right now, so I don't think anybody's really that concerned. But thank you for putting it into perspective for us on the global macro scale. I really appreciate our conversation. Thank you for uh, enlightening us, Joe. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be with you. All right. And uh, thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.